The sorority had two stories and a basement. Other than storage, we only used the basement for initiation and other ceremonies. The first floor had a kitchen, dining room, study room, living room, guest bedroom, and the house mother's room. The guest room and the house mother's room were in the front of the house facing the street. The second floor was full of bedrooms with two to six girls in each room. It also had all of the showers except for one in the guest room that was never used. About 50 girls lived in the house together and it was a ton of fun, with parties almost every night. Of course, with that many girls sharing one space, people got on each other's nerves every now and then. One big point of contention was food. Although we were provided with three square meals Monday through Friday, many girls kept their own provisions in a small kitchen behind the main kitchen. One girl named Megan loved to bake and would always be happy to share her creations once they were perfectly frosted or whatever. Right after winter break, Megan baked a tray of brownies and left them to cool overnight while she went to bed. When I woke up the next morning, a group of girls were sitting around the table drinking coffee and bitching about Kristen, who apparently came home drunk the night before and dug into Megan's brownies with her bare hands. There was a big messy chunk missing from the middle of the pan with fingernail marks along the bottom. I agreed that it was pretty fucked up. Kristen, of course, denied that she had anything to do with it. However, things started being eaten in the middle of the night with some regularity. The suspects were always the ladies who came home late after partying. One night there was a formal event that required all of the girls to be out of the sorority. The only person left at home was Miss Betty, our house mother. She was a sweet woman in her 70s who pretty much let us get away with anything and everything. On this particular evening, Miss Betty heard the shower running in the guest room. She knocked on the guest room, but nobody answered. She cracked the door open and saw a pile of clothes with the sorority's letters, sorority t-shirt, sorority sweatshirt, sweatpants, and hat. Miss Betty entered the guest room and said something along the lines of, Are you okay, dear? Because it was so odd for someone to be using the guest room shower. The shower room turned off and there was a grunting thud against the inside of the bathroom door. Very alarmed, Miss Betty tried to force her way into the bathroom asking if the person inside needed help. To her dismay, a low male voice grunted back, Go away! Miss Betty told him to get dressed and that she was calling the police. The unwanted house guest stayed in the bathroom until the police arrived. They determined that he snuck into the sorority during winter break picking out clothes from different rooms. He made himself a little home in the basement and had apparently lived there for almost a month. We had at least one ceremony in the basement during the period of time he would have been living there. So, I guess, he was watching. As of now, I'm a junior in college. This story took place the spring semester of my freshman year. My friend Jane and I decided to do spring rush at our college. For those of you that aren't familiar with the Greek system, my college had traditional fall rushing for sororities. You go through the application process, do certain things for different sororities, etc. Then they had spring rush for the girls that didn't get in during the fall or if they changed their mind throughout the year. Jane was my roommate and she kind of dragged me into it. It was a, uh, if I have to suffer, then so do you type of thing. I went along with it, having never even thought about being in a sorority before. The process went smoothly, and we got to the second to last phase before big day, the day you find out if you got into the sorority. One of the missions that the sorority sisters had us do was to house sit for them while they went out and got completely shit-faced on a Friday night. No big deal. I had Jane to keep me company anyway. We were given a strict list of who was and wasn't allowed into the house. All Jane and I had to do was order our weight in pizza, watch One Tree Hill, and just a little bit of homework to do while we waited. It wasn't until about 1am did the shit start. Someone rang the doorbell. I answered. It was a guy, older, maybe 25 or so. He looked past college age. He asked me if it was a certain address and I told him no, then asked if he needed to speak to someone. He said no, he thanked me, then walked away. 
I really didn't think anything of it. It's college, Friday slash Saturday morning rather, and it was nighttime and people get drunk so shit happens. One of the sorority girls calls and says they'll be back to the house in about an hour, so around 2 to 2.30 a.m. That's great. Then the doorbell rings again. Jane and I both answer it at the same time. It's the same guy. He looks at Jane, seemingly shocked to see her. Let me just describe his face to you, now that I'm thinking about it. It was wrinkled. He had deep laugh lines for such a young guy. Hazel eyes. They were speckled with dark colors. Black hair, a bit of stubble. Plainly attractive, but no catch. Very tall and lean. An average Joe. Again, he asked me if it was a certain address. Jane straightens up and tells him to, and I quote, suck my dick, then close the door in his face. We laughed about the poor drunken frat guy that didn't remember where he lived. That's all we thought it was. Before we could get back into the living room area, the guy started pounding on the door and screaming for Kayla. He said her name over and over again. I didn't even have time to be scared because the window that was right next to the front door shattered. The fucker crawled inside, fell to the floor having lost his balance, and looks directly at me. My name isn't fucking Kayla, but he was looking at me like it was. Jane flipped her shit and ran upstairs. How classic, right? And I just stood there, baffled at what happened. I was paralyzed. The man kept asking for Kayla, got up, and looked at me like he was about to charge, like I was a piece of meat and he was a starving man. I just shook my head. I heard Jane on the phone somewhere upstairs. Then she called my name, came running downstairs. That's when he did something so, so unexpected. As Jane ran down the stairs, the man actually floored it to meet her. He started growling and screaming and howling. I can't explain it. He sounded deranged. Jane was so startled that she fell coming down the stairs, sprained her ankle, and just laid there, screaming. The guy laughed, walked past me, and then just casually climbed back out through the window. Campus police showed up about five minutes later, then the sisters did. Turns out that Kayla was a sister that was kicked out a few weeks prior. She had a boyfriend who was abusive, addicted to meth, all of the above, that broke into their house before and they fucking failed to mention that small little detail. He was arrested later that night, sobered up and was released the next day. The next day was actually big day. Jane and I got bids but I declined. Jane accepted. We're still friends and it always makes for a good story to tell the incoming freshman girls who plan on rushing. This happened to a friend of a friend's mom. It was the 70s and she was in a sorority in college. She went out with some friends to a bar and started chatting with some guy sitting next to her. He was normal, cute, and friendly. She thought nothing odd of him. The girls had decided to hit the bar before going to a party, so it came time for them to go. The guy asked her if she was sure she wouldn't rather go to a party at his house, and she said no thanks and left with her friends. Later, after she's arrived home and is in her room getting ready for bed, she hears a noise outside her door. She opens her bedroom door on the second floor and sees a man, the same one from the bar, stealthily walking up her stairs. She lived in a duplex, and the dog from next door had started barking, which scares him and he runs. A year or so later, she's watching the news, and sees the man's face from the bar. It's Ted Bundy. Two years ago, my life was completely different. I was in a sorority, I had lots of friends, and I was outgoing. That was until the night of our Halloween grab-a-date. For those who have never been in the Greek system, it's a party where you invite only one person as a date. I had recently met a gorgeous guy who was on my college football team. I invited him and he said yes, but that his friend from out of town had to go too. I convinced a naive freshman to take him. 
On the afternoon of the big day, there was a football game. So unlike the majority of girls and their dates, I had to wait for my date instead of getting drunk. The game ended with just enough time to take a shot of vodka with my date and the two guys before we had to rush to the bus to meet the freshmen and go to the boat where the party would be held. I ended up finding my date and his friend rather creepy while on the boat and ignored him for most of the night and just danced with my friends instead. Unfortunately, my keys were at his apartment, so after we got off the boat and back to the Greek system, I had to return to his place. This was when things went wrong. I quickly went to his place and grabbed my keys, but by the time I found them, he poured a shot for each of us. It was just me, his friend, and himself. I at first declined, but they insisted I take it before I leave. I don't remember anything after that shot. The grab -a date was on October 30th, Halloween morning I woke up to a strange beeping. I was extremely confused and had no idea where I was, but I was terrified. I felt too weak to move, and after a few minutes realized that the beeping was coming from the machine that I was attached to. Even then I didn't realize where I was, I just started yelling. After what seemed like an eternity, a grumpy nurse walked in. I asked her for a phone, which she gave me and left. In my confusion, I couldn't figure out the phone, so I had to yell for her to come back. Eventually, I figured it out and called my dad. This was the scariest Halloween for my father, waking up early from an unknown caller that ended up being your daughter two hours away in the ER. After that phone call, I fell asleep and woke up to my dad in the room, crying. It turned out that I had stopped breathing a few times that night. The first time was within a half hour of taking that shot. I later found out that rather than calling for help, he left my body on the footsteps of my sorority, where thankfully another girl was coming home while he was walking away. She was the one who called the ambulance. Unfortunately, I did not get tested. In my confusion, I refused to be drug tested that morning and kept insisting that I wanted to go home. Too weak to walk, I had to be wheelchaired out then carried to my dad's car. My dad's partner works in the ER and said that it sounded like I had an allergic reaction to roofies. One of my mom's friends from a hospital suggested that as well, but by the time I wanted to be checked out, the hospital said it would have been out of my system by then. Later that day, I looked through my cell phone and found I had texted a few of my friends for help, that I was creeped out and that I was scared. I had also received a text from him saying he wanted me to go to the bathroom and give him head. I decided to reply to his text and ask him what had happened and that I had woken up in the hospital. He replied, That sucks. As if this ordeal wasn't enough, after a few days when I returned to the school and sorority, a rumor had started that I had had alcohol poisoning. When I tried claiming that wasn't what happened, People told me I was just too embarrassed to admit it. I was even sent to standards, sorority court for when you get punished, and told I wasn't allowed to go on another gravidate that quarter. Very few girls asked if I was okay. I wasn't. I love camping. Anytime my friends and I came home from college, we would load up our cooler with beer grab some gear and go screw around outside. Unfortunately, when I was actually at school, none of my sorority sisters or other friends ever wanted to go with me, so I would often suffer withdrawals from camping. One day the weather was way too nice to waste, so I grabbed some of my gear, hopped in a car I borrowed from a buddy, and drove to a spot that was secluded, yet within a safe distance to civilization that I could run and get help if need be. Camping also creeps me out sometimes, but that creepy feeling is also somewhat of a plus for me. It's the same reason that people read these kind of scary stories. It's fun to be scared. So I make a little camp and get a fire going. I hadn't brought all that much to eat, but I was enjoying myself, reading and looking around the area, that sort of thing. I suddenly got the feeling that I was being watched, and I stopped dead in my tracks. I hear a twig crunch over to my right, then see a doe bolt from a hundred feet or so in front of me. 
I laughed at myself and went back to the camp with an armful of wood I had gathered. I kept freaking myself out, hearing sounds just outside of the ring of light cast by the fire. I always get inside my head so I shrugged it off and kept whittling at a stick I had been messing with. Around one I decided to go into my tent and snuff out the lantern. I had been slamming beers in the most unladylike fashion and smoking cheap cigars. Another reason I like camping, I can act however I want, so I passed out relatively quick. About two in the morning I start hearing footsteps, and they sound pretty light and sort of timid. I think to myself it's a deer or another animal, more likely a raccoon because I probably left some food out. I'm still on guard though. About 30 minutes of sleeping with one eye open I hear a rubbing noise and the tent fabric is being pushed in a bit. I don't know how I didn't shit my sleeping bag, but I just sat there paralyzed with my caw bar in hand. I desperately wanted to thrust the knife through the tent fabric, but I was still holding out hope that it was some of my buddies from a frat joking with me. And then as suddenly as it had begun, it all stopped. I was starting to feel slightly more secure, because daylight would be coming in about two or three hours, but I sure as shit wasn't going to go to sleep. All of a sudden, at about four o'clock, I realized I should put my boots on so that if anything did happen, I would be ready. After having stayed up and keeping alert a little while longer, my friend's car alarm goes blaring. I freak the fuck out and run out of the tent. I go about two steps before something grabs me around the mouth. I open my mouth to scream but instead the person's pinky finger slips between my teeth. I've heard that people can perform superhuman feats when they have huge adrenaline rushes. In my case, I just clamp down and there's no way to say this without sounding ridiculous. His finger popped off. He screamed, pulled his hand away with the missing digit falling to the ground. He took off running down the hill I was camping on and I took off right quick in the opposite direction. I must have looked ridiculous to the people whose house I ran to. A little sorority girl in a wife beater, boxers, and steel toe boots. I also had some blood that had oozed out of my lip not from the finger, but because I had also managed to take a pretty good chunk out of my lip as well. I told them what had happened. They called the police got me some real clothing and the man at the house made me a whiskey and coke. When the cops got there they checked it out. The cops went to check it out and when they came back it was light out. They brought me back so I could get my friend's car and what I saw just made me even more terrified. Right next to the tent was a red gas can. He could have just lit me on fire earlier. The finger was also gone suggesting he had come back for it. The kicker is that they never caught the guy, so somewhere out there is a man sitting down to dinner, maybe alone, maybe with a wife and a couple of kids, and he's missing his right pinky.